Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 445 for the 19th of Shvat in a regular year. There is a really famous book written by a man named Eckhart Tolle, which many of you may have heard of before, called The Power of Now. Uh, this is not a religious book per se, but it's a very spiritual kind of new agey book, and it's really popular. I read it uh, a few years ago, and I actually found it pretty powerful myself. Um, kind of like just, you know, this, this it's, a, it's a good reminder to us to be present, to live in the present moment, to live in the now, you know, the idea of how anxiety is really all about worrying about the future over which we really ultimately have no control. Depression is over uh, really dwelling on the past, also what we have absolutely no control over. And what we really can focus on and we really, really can put our energies into is in the now. This is you know, a really common idea. People often attribute this idea to more Eastern kind of religions like you know mindfulness and Buddhism, uh, Taoism, you know, things like that. But the truth is, as we'll learn today, this is actually a very, very Jewish idea of living in the now and what that's all about. Now, the Jewish take on it, as we'll learn today and what we're going to focus on, is the fact that as we've discussed and where we sort of left off yesterday, yesterday in yesterday's portion, is we spoke about this idea of God being transcendent and above time and how ultimately, you know, time is just a creation, just like space is a creation, just like, you know, the whole world is a creation. Time is a creation as well, a creation by God, which means that God, since God created time, God is above time and God transcends time. That's why we talk about the eternality of God. And we spoke about this idea of, this is where we left off yesterday, about how when we perform a mitzvah, we're tapping into God's supernal will, which taps us into God himself. And that gives us a glimpse. It gives us a, a sort of way to connect to this transcendent reality of the world. Now today, we're going to come back down to earth uh, in the sense that we're going to, well, at the same time, acknowledging the transcendence of God, acknowledging the transcendence of the Torah and the mitzvahs, we're also going to acknowledge the fact that at the same time, we do live here in time. And time is very much a creation of God. And the fact that it's a creation of God means that it's something that's very real and that we are bound to time. And it's something that we need to contend with. It's something that we need to acknowledge. But at the same time, there's a way to sort of like, you know, live with both realities at the same time, to, to acknowledge our uh, our boundness to time and at the same time to acknowledge that there's something that exists that's beyond time that can kind of transport port us beyond the boundary of times. Now the the take the angle that the ultra is going to take on this is by focusing on uh, two places that we find in davening, two places in our prayers two interesting places that we find when we pray uh, that at first glance seem to be kind of, there's some questions about them and he's going to, he's going to address the questions. The first one is the idea that we say uh, every day, three times a day during the Amida prayer, during the, the Shemona Esra prayer, we, one of the blessings that we say is Slach lanu, is forgive us for we have sinned. And you know, if you think about this, this is kind of strange, you know, because like we know that there's already, a, there's a precept that we're not supposed to sin really ever, right? But especially we're not supposed to sin with the intention of later doing tshuva. Like we're not allowed to go into a McDonald's, eat a cheeseburger and say, 
you know what? I'm going to eat this che- cheeseburger. It's okay. I'll just, you know, I'll just return to God afterwards. I'll, I'll do what I need to do and I'll restore my soul to God. Like that, if we do that, you know, there's, there's always room for tshuva. There's always a way to return to God regardless of how far a person has strayed. But you can't like, you know, before the fact, have that intention in mind of going to do whatever you want with the intention that you're just going to come back to God at the end, you know, it, it needs to be sincere. It needs to be that like, when we sincerely come back to God, it's because we truly regretted straying from him. So if that's the case, then this blessing seems really strange because like we know, you know, if you're the type of person that prays three times a day, this is something that you've taken upon yourself. Or even if you do it like once a day or whatever, it's like, it's embedded into the prayers. It's sort of like, we're kind of saying that we are, are acknowledging that we're going to mess up. We're acknowledging that we're going to sin. And we're acknowledging day after day that we want God to forgive us. I mean, what if we really are these perfect people and we don't sin? You know, like why why is this embedded into the prayer? It should be sort of like an optional thing that we add into the prayer in case if we happen to stumble into sin, but not something that's like the chatechila there, you know? We found a similar thing actually back in the times of the temple that there was a certain sacrifice that we would give on a daily basis. This was the the sacrifice of the tamid, the, the tamid sacrifice, which was given for neglect of positive commandments. And this was something that was sacrificed on a daily basis. Uh, and the idea behind it, the reasoning behind it, was that pretty much everybody is is um, is liable for neglect of a positive commandment in some way. As the sages explained that nobody is exempt from not being neglectful of Torah study on some level. You know, like it's like we're all, we're human. So it's like every single moment of the day, are we really engaged in Torah study every single second? Like we should be. This is something that everybody is guilty of. But so if everybody's guilty of it at some point or another, first of all, it's like, how is it that God uh, commands us to do something that <laughs> where is impossible? And secondly, if we're all guilty of, li- of it always, how can we say that we're sincerely sorry, that we're sincerely repenting when we're just going to go and do it again and again, you know? So this is the first thing that the altar is going to address, this this prayer of slach lanu, forgive us. And what does this entail? What does this mean? And the second prayer that the that the altar is going to focus on in today's Tanya is actually the Shema prayer, where we find that the origins of the Shema prayer actually come from Moshe Rabbein, or from Moshe, our leader back in the day who he got the Torah from, and that Moshe gave this, told the Jewish people that they need to say the Shema prayer twice a day on a daily basis, and that the, the, the body of the Shema prayer, what it's all about is declaring our willingness to sacrifice our lives for God. And again, this is a strange thing if you really look at the details of it, because at the time that Moshe Rabbeinu gave, told the Jewish people that they need to, when he instituted the Shema prayer, this was right around the time when God actually promised the Jewish people that no harm would come to them from the foreign nations. So this seems like in that case that it would be an insincere prayer, right? Because like, on the one hand, you know, we're saying that we're willing to sacrifice our lives for the sake of God. That's so, that's very nice that we're saying this on a daily basis. It's easy to say that if we know that we're protected, if we know that this isn't actually going to ever have to have to come to that, you know, that God is protecting us at that t- uh, as he was at that time during the desert. So what was this all about? You know, why, why is it that Moshe Rabbeinu instituted this Shema prayer? not only for the generations in the desert, but actually for us as well and for future generations to come as well. So we're going to get into the text. And as we'll see the answer to these two things, to these two um, challenges that are brought up, this uh, the answer to why it is that we uh, say every single day, three times a day, forgive us for we have sinned, um, kind of implying that we're going to keep sinning <laughs> no matter what. And that it's like we're sinning for the sake of repenting as well as, um, as well as the fact that we say the Shema prayer twice a day, uh, declaring our willingness to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of God, even though this sounds like we're being insincere because we, at the same time, we trust that God's going to protect us from all harm. The answer to both of these quandaries, to both of these challenges, comes to the same point, which is that it's all about living in the now. It's all about acknowledging the fact that at this moment, at this very moment, all we have is this very moment. And then the next moment, all we have is the next moment. And the next moment, all we have is the next moment. That's that's all we have. And we need to be present with that moment. And every moment that we tap into the goodness of that moment and our utmost potential, 
we're tapping into the transcendent nature of God and the uh, and we're rising above time. So this requires further explanation, obviously. So with that being said, let's get into the text and I'll explain more in further detail. We'll, we'll come to understand it as we go. So for context, uh, we're, we're going to be exploring the end of chapter 25 today of Likutei Amarim. And this, this section begins, again, following from yesterday's section, where we, yesterday we concluded with this idea of how it is that when we perform the positive commandments, what we're doing is we are tapping into uh, the in eternal, the, the transcendent, because the positive commandments are God's supernal will, and God's supernal will is unified with God. So we're tapping into this unity, we're becoming one with God's supernal will, and by extension, God himself, which brings us to a state that is above time, that reveals this transcendent nature. But now we begin today. Down here below, we are within the bounds of time. And when we keep Torah and mitzvahs, th these are happening, our involvement in Torah mitzvahs are happening within the bounds of time. We see indeed that, you know, most of the mitzvahs have to do with there's a certain time limit to them. There's a certain boundary through which we have to keep them. Think about Shabbos, for example, you know, think about waiting between milk and meat uh, that you have to, you have to wait six hours or, you know, there's different customs, customs around that after eating meat before you can eat milk. There's so many different examples of that, right? Um, and we also see that in another way that we can see this idea of like being time bound in terms of the mitzvahs that at, in one moment a person is keeping a mitzvah they're involved in the mitzvah that they're doing they're involved in torah study and then the next second like you know like right now we're learning tanya very great you know really connecting to god but then after you finish this maybe you're gonna go and eat lunch <laughs> maybe you're gonna go exercise maybe you're gonna go hang out with your friends or something you're gonna do something that is not necessarily directly connected to your service of God. So there's sort of like this incongruence that happens between mo one moment to the, to the next, which seems to imply that there's a disruption in this unity that we've produced through doing a mitzvah. So and when we talked about, you know, this great unity, this like unity that transcends time, that's eternal and all of that. And then it's like, okay, back down to earth. That's great that we had that for one moment. What happened at the next moment? It, that unity is not there anymore, right? But continues the ultra and this is the interesting thing. When a person then goes back, you know, so it's like, okay, you're listening to this Tanya portion, portion, very nice. Then you go and you eat lunch and you're not really thinking about God. You're just eating, thinking about your hunger and, and uh, filling your stomach and all that. Let's say then after that, you go back and you go back to your service with Torah and Tefillah, with Torah and prayer. And you realize, oh, wow, you know, I really... I wasn't really fully involved in uh, connecting to God as much as I could have. I could have been involved in more Torah and um, and being and, and being involved in connecting to God more. Then God's going to forgive you every single time. God is continuously forgives. There's no limit to God's forgiveness. And uh, and the Alter Rebbe brings a proof of this from the Gemara in Masechet Yoma, page 86a, where where it says, "Avar lo zaz misham ad lo." That if a person neglected to perform form a positive precept and repented, he's pardoned forthwith. So it's like there's always a chance to go back and do tshuva over the fact that you neglected to do something that you could have done. And we see, says the Alter Abed, that this is why we have this bracha that I mentioned in the introduction in the Amida prayer of Slach Lanu, forgive us for we have sinned. And we say this three times a day. And the reason why we're saying this is for is is for this uh, the sin of neglect of Torah study, which nobody is exempt from this. No matter you know who they are, there's always going to be a moment in the day that you are going to be neglectful of Torah study. That's just how we are, which is why we have this prayer built into it to allow God to forgive us. Uh, and we see that this is um, this blessing of forgive us for we have sinned is pa parallels the tamid offering, the burnt offering that was sacrificed every day uh, in the temple for the neglect of positive precepts. It was the same idea. So now, says the Alter Rebbe, so he addresses the question, which I had mentioned in the introduction, that you might think that this is the idea of that I will sin and I will repent. I will sin and I will repent. Like, you know, that it's like if we're saying it every single day, we're like, we're, it's like we're predetermining. We're like, oh, you know, in a couple of hours, I'm going to say that prayer again. 
God, forgive me for I have sinned. It sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm like expecting of myself that I'm going to sin. I'm planning to sin. It sounds like, um, but says the ultra, but this is not the case. This is only the case if while the person is engaged in the sin, they're relying on the facts that they're going to do tshuva later. Um, and that's, you know, that's not the idea. So this is where we start to come into this idea of living in the now, that it's really about the present moment in the present moment that you're living in. You know, it's like we all make mistakes. We're all human. We're all fallible. This is sort of the idea. This is the, the, reassurance that the Tanya gives us that nobody is exempt from um, messing up from time to time. Nobody is exempt from uh, neglecting Torah study at some point during their day. This doesn't mean that you seek this out. It's, you know, it's, it's like every moment you need to be in that moment and try to be your best. And then, yeah, okay, so, you know, we're not perfect. So sure. So then we're going to say that prayer of God, forgive us and, and God will forgive us because he continues to forgive us. But in the moment, we try to do our best. And now from here, the Ultra Rabbi is going to take this idea even to a deeper level, and he's going to bring up this idea that I mentioned in the introduction about this uh, this commandment that Moshe gave to the Jewish people in um, to the generation that was entering into the land of Israel to read the Shema prayer twice a day. And the idea of the Shema prayer, as I mentioned, was that... Um, we're accepting the yoke of heaven to the point of self-sacrifice. And so then the altar of it asks, so it, this seems like a strange prayer because right around that time, we see that in Devarim chapter 11, verse 25, um, then uh, then we see that Moshe told the Jewish people that he said, that God will lay the fear and dread of you upon all the inhabitants of the land. So on the one hand, Moshe Rabbeinu told the Jewish people, don't worry, God is going to protect you. Uh, you know, the, all the other nations around you are going to fear you and no harm can come to you or anything. On the other hand, he says to them, okay, but now's the time you have to start saying this prayer twice a day, declaring that you're willing to give up your life for God, uh, to sacrifice your life for God. Right. And again, it seems kind of like an in, uh, in disingenuous prayer that you're saying that you're, it's very easy to say that you're willing to sacrifice your life for God if you know that's totally theoretical and that's never going to happen. But as we'll learn, as we'll see, in fact, the the declaration of being willing to sell, to sacrifice your life for the sake of God actually has a much deeper meaning to it and actually is applicable to every single moment of our lives, every single mitzvah that we do, even if we're not literally, you know, being faced with this challenge of worship an idol or give up your life. So we'll see, we see here that actually this is where this portion of the Tanya, we're, we're tying it back into the last two portions that we learned about how, you know, how a person can come to such a state of recognizing how accessible it is to refrain from doing any transgression against God and how accessible it is also to really put oneself fully into keeping the positive commandments in a full and exerting themselves in a full way and not being lazy, not, you know, holding back in any way um, from the apparent suffering that they might have to endure and really pushing themselves to keep to keep uh, the positive commandments fully um, because we recognize this idea of this self-sacrificial nature that we have within us. So if you haven't listened to the last couple of episodes, I really encourage you to do that or you can go back and review it. But the basic idea that we learned there is that we learned about this idea about how every single Jew has within them this inherent power this inherent um, willingness to sacrifice our lives rather than bow to an idol, rather than um, renounce our Judaism, renounce the unity of God. And when we really tap into this, then we'll come to realize that anytime we do anything that opposes God's will, or anytime we neglect from doing something that really is in line with God's will, this separates us from God. And so on a, while we may not be as conscious of it at the time, it may not be as in our face at the time as when there's like a literal idol in front of us, us it's the same process, it's the same thing. So the whole idea, so this is going back to why it is that Moshe Rabbeinu gave us this prayer and made it so essential that we say this prayer twice a day, the Shema prayer declaring our willingness to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of God, God, for the sake of God, is because in fact we see that this this um, this awareness, this consciousness of 
of our self-sacrificial nature for God's sake is actually something that is uh, essential for us keeping the mitzvahs on any level, you know, every day in a, on a daily basis. Um, and this is what's going to allow us to overcome our impulses to not serve God at every moment, as was explained above. So that's the end of the section for today. So the bottom line message, again, bringing it back to, you know, the power of now living in the moment. So what the, the main message, the main takeaway that we want to take from here is that uh, while God is transcendent, while God's uh, will is transcendent, his supreme will is transcendent, we live here in the now. And one moment to the next, things change. But all we can focus on is really now in this present moment, serving God, not serving God. What are we doing? And the way that we can really come to the state of serving God at every single moment is by tapping into the self-sacrificial nature that we have within ourselves, that, uh, that you know, the part of ourselves, the, the nefesh alakis, the godly soul who doesn't want to ever be separate from God and who would be willing and that the part of us that would be willing to give up our lives rather than go against God's unity. And when we recognize this within ourselves, then this is going to motivate us to want to do God's will on every level, even in the smallest day-to-day -day activities of what happens. And are we gonna mess up? Sure, we're gonna mess up, but that's for later. That's not something we wanna focus on right now. You know, what we wanna do is we really wanna be present in the moment and do our best. And then when we make mistakes, we go back and we ask God for forgive us, to forgive us and he'll forgive us over and over and over again, you know? Once again, I always, you know, use my, um, my exercise, my physical fitness uh, practice as a metaphor for this. You know, every day I show up to my yoga practice, my handstand practice, contortion practice, really trying to do my best, really trying to push myself to the ultimate as much as I can. Am I going to make a mistake? Am I going to fall? Most probably yes, but I don't go into that with that mentality. I go in giving it my all. And then when I do inevitably fall, as I most likely will, then I get back up again and I go and I um, return to my body. I return to my practice. And it's the same thing here. This is this is the whole idea is that we live um, when we live a life of trying to connect with God, trying to serve God, trying to become one with God and unified with God, which is what the Tanya is trying to teach us to do. It's a minute by minute, moment by moment thing. And the way that we can get there is really trying to attune ourselves to this self-sacrificial nature that we have within us, which is why the Shema prayer is so intrinsic, is so essential to our Judaism, to our Jewish life. Uh, and it's not theoretical at all. It's not about just like having, you know, um, it's not just relevant for, um, for times when, God forbid, we actually do have to uh, make that real choice of giving up our lives or not. It's it's about living with the awareness that we would, that we would actually give up our lives, that that's who we are as Jews. And since that is who we are essentially as Jews, then that translates into, into meaning that we're going to do whatever we can to do whatever it is that God wants of us as much as we can to our fullest ability. So that's the end of the section for today. And we'll continue, continue tomorrow when we begin a new chapter. And I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast, hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzhak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.